Welcome, everyone. Do we have our mics live? We do. Okay, really excited for this session. I see some, some great friendly faces, uh, people I've been working a lot with over the past year, and a lot of new faces. Um, I don't know about you guys, this is my first in-person event in over two years. If it is your first in-person event since February of 2020, raise your hand. Okay, mm-hmm, yep. All right, so this morning we shared a lot of innovation, right? Now we're, we're breaking it down. Like, here's the how-to and the people leading these efforts and what they're doing. Um, I'm so excited to welcome Eric Kern to this chat. Thank you, Eric. And I also have to click the slides, which means I need to turn and look. <laughs> um, but we're talking about how to build a team for success, right? Because that is super critical to leveraging any of the technology, driving your transformation. So without further ado, we're gonna get started. Um, we're gonna do some introductions. Eric, um, we're gonna hear all about you and your role. Um, why don't we do a quick intro on your role today at Trinet and, and uh, what you do there. Sure, it, how's the audio, audio is okay? I, I think so, are you good on audio? <laughs> okay, all right. Sure, so I, I work at Trinet. Um, I do solution architecture there for RPA. Um, my background in RPA is uh, I started off as a developer in 2016 and the past few years I've been doing uh, platform lead stuff. Um, and so in the spirit of, of transformation, um, and excited to, to talk more about transformation across an automation team. Okay. Let, let's get to know a little bit more about the real Eric, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot, okay? Um, bagels or donuts? Oh, bagels. Bagels, okay. <laughs> we got some more bagel people in here. All right, um, one cup of coffee or Java all morning long? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> if it's those two options, I, I guess I'll go with coffee. The first one cup of coffee. One is cup fine. of coffee. And what, what's your coffee jam? What's your drink of choice? Oh, I, straight straight black coffee. The latte. I do, I do straight black. I'll do. Uh, I I kind of overload caffeine sometimes. So I'll do cold brew. Okay. Espresso. Power it up. Yeah. All right. I myself had a triple shot this morning. Um, okay. Uh, Time travel or stay at home? Time travel. Time travel, okay. Beach or mountains for vacation? Uh, mountains. Okay, right on. All right, we know a little bit about the real Eric, right? Um, but all of you have you know, big jobs driving technology transformation. Eric, you have agreed to spend some time talking about how you and Trinet have built a team for success. So thank you very much. I'm gonna click ahead, I have to turn my head, but I also have to ground us all in the technology we're talking about, right? You've heard Audi, Mahir, a bunch of my colleagues talk about the automation success platform. We released 10 new innovations this morning. Um, give us your feedback, folks, uh, both on how you're building your teams for success when we get to the Q&A. And afterwards, we really want to know the technology innovation that's most exciting for you. Um, so Eric, obviously you know, I'm going to ask you, of, of everything that you heard at the keynote this morning, what particular piece of innovation are you like, I can't wait to get my team's hands on that? That's probably your toughest question yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think all the IDP stuff is pretty interesting, but also the embedded automation, I know I have a a full laundry list of, of different items I'm gonna bring back to my team when I get back. Okay, let's hear it for embedded automation. All right, so, Trinet, you've been there a few years. Um, we talked this morning in the keynote, some folks are just starting their journeys, some are in seller acceleration. I know some folks in the room are, are often hyperscale. Where is Trinet on their journey? Just take us through it a little bit. Sure, so I think we're probably somewhere in between. Um, RPA at Trina has been around for four years, and uh, over that course of time, um, we've automated over 120 processes. Uh, we'll typically have around 30 use cases in the pipeline that we're managing, and um, our automations have spanned across a number of the different business units in the company, just to name a few, uh, payroll, tax, HR, engineering. 
uh, finance is another big one. And at this point, we're operating mainly out of a centralized COE um, operating model. However, we do support a couple of citizen developers across the business, and um, we have plans to expand that um, down the road. Uh, and, and just another interesting, interesting thing about our program is how it started off being initially owned by the business. So it wasn't until uh, pretty recently, just a few months ago, that it moved into engineering ownership. And so that's kind of kicked off this pretty exciting transformation, uh, one where our main operating goal has become to run RPA as this proper software factory model, uh, one that has predictable outputs, uh, where our core metric to, to gauge that we're on the right track there is going to be whether or not we're running outside of this agile framework. Okay, so your automation started in the business, moved to engineering, and I'm sure that has also been a catalyst for looking at the team structure. Um, was there a moment, a catalyzing moment, when you and Trinet or you personally realized, like, you know what, we need, we need to restructure for, for acceleration? Oh, yeah, for sure. So, um, <laughs> I don't, like I said, I've been in Trinet four years, but there was a, a year gap in, in 2021. I went to work for a couple of different um, organizations, and I had the opportunity to work in, uh, in a company where they had a large enterprise a rollout of, of RPA and everyone was working within a, a proper agile setup. Um, so when I came back to Trina in March of this year, um, I, had, I had seen how agile works within the RPA space and that was definitely something that my management was uh, especially interested in as well. And, and just to give you some context and a background of what our program had, had ran initially before our team transformed, is uh, we had a, a single COE team with a single platform owner and a bunch of these dual automation analyst developer roles. So I, I think it might be kind of common across some of the different uh, RPA implementations where you have this dual role, this person will get the business requirements, they'll execute, build the bot, and then they'll support it once it's in production. Um, and that worked well when our program was young, but when I left the company, when I came back in March, I saw that some of the, the symptoms had kind of um, grown into being inefficiencies that, that were clear across the team. I'm just fixing the slides. Ignore no worries, <laughs> no worries. And, and so the, there was sort of this inflection point with our developers because of those time constraints I had mentioned with everything they were being asked to work on. Um, and that kind of aligned with the catalyzing moment. It's like, okay, we, we got to make a change here, we need to uh, transform the team and um, place some uh, value on refining the roles across the team um, to create opportunities for folks to specialize, standardize, and optimize in various roles. Uh, rather than having a single role asking someone to be great at three things, we could have three roles asking them to be great at a, at a single thing. Um, the second thing that we learned through this experience was to um, put value in investing in building of the team. And for us, this meant that we would try to bring in um, everyone and, and upskill who was already within the, tree, within the team and within Trinet, but also meant that we had to reach out and bring in other skills and experiences for people and, and bring them into the, the Trinet team. And then the third thing that, that we learned is to optimize process uh, requirements and intake. Um, so the idea to build uh, clear and concise requirements that uh, don't change in scope. I can imagine if you're expanding the team and moving people into specialization and to scale, you have to standardize, right? I have a feeling that that's what a lot of people are dealing with. Um, so you, you're making this pivot to Agile, right? So I'm, I'm an Agile fangirl from way back, um, was part of a team to completely transition an engineering organization, gosh, 15 years ago. Um, it's no small undertaking, right? I have a question for the group. Uh, who else has an agile methodology in their organization? Some folks, okay. All right, so you have a little bit of time under your belt, right? So for the folks who haven't yet made that transition, what, oh, sorry, click the slides. Um, what's the structure, particularly 
the roles and the responsibility. You've taken someone who did three jobs, you've had them specialize into one, you've added some roles. What, what are the highlights of the structure now? Sure, so you, you mentioned all the um, lessons and experiences that we went through that kind of shaped this future state. Um, some of the roles that are specifically inherent to Agile and that we created for this new structure are the, the product owner and the scrum master. So these two folks are... Oh, here, let me play. Oh, thanks. Okay. They're part of our Agile delivery team. And everything in the operating model and the SDLC workflow begins with the product owner behind it. Um, this person will work directly with the business to build the requirements. They work on process intake. And at the end of, of uh, kind of an output of, of what they do is they finalize the business case and then the product owner will create the user stories and add it to the sprint backlog. Um, from there, that's kind of where the scrum master comes to the picture. So this person, they're kind of like the agile go-to SME in the team. Um, they can provide coaching to other team members and especially if you have a lot of developers who come from a business background and might not necessarily um, know Agile that well. Um, our Scrum Master has, rec and, and this is us, right? We, we have a couple of developers who, who fit that mold. Our Scrum Master has recommended training and they're there to support every step along the way. So, so getting back to the, to the roles here, the Scrum Master, after the stories are in the backlog, then this person will facilitate um, all the remaining Agile ceremonies and meetings and the next meeting in that process is going to be the sprint planning meeting. So in this meeting, that's the, the first um, meeting that our dev team is going to be involved in. And in here, we'll have the dev team, scrum master, product owner, uh, our platform owner, and our solution architect. And, and going through this call, they'll um, pick up the user stories to take into their sprints, which are typically two or two and a half week cycles. Um, and um, our dev, dev and QA will agree to pick up whatever they think they can finish and complete within that sprint cycle. So I'll, I'll just uh, make another comment here about Agile, and you know all this, but uh, the, the core idea with Agile is to take something big and break it up into smaller pieces, and that's what allows us to take on um, separate user stories, which could represent separate functions of a, of a more broad, um, business case and allows our dev team to kind of iterate and chunk through and work through portions of that story uh, of that business case but be able to show real progress while working through development. You know I, I have to go off slide for a moment because you touched on something that I've heard from so many of all of you around expectations on delivery particularly for different lines of business and different stakeholders who have let's say a sliding scale of understanding about complexity of automation use cases and how long things take. So are you at the stage where you're showing partial demos, 30% demos, 60%, okay, it's 100% done with your business stakeholders, or does it help with expectation setting? Do you have to do extra work because of this model? Gotcha, so a lot of what we're discussing today excuse me, is, is part of our future state. We're actually wrapping up our migration within the next couple of weeks. And once we do that, we're gonna go fully tilt and kind of move into this agile um, operating model. But to your point, I have seen um, in, in well-functioning agile teams where they'll do demos uh, along the way. So I've seen it work to where they'll do demos for every 20%, 50%, if it, if it makes any sense for grouping different uh, functionalities of, of an epic together to do the demonstration, then oftentimes um, they'll, they'll do that. But every step along the way, the business is gonna be informed. There's gonna be no surprises. And uh, yeah, that's it. That expectation setting is, is just really, really important. So yeah, that's why Agile can be so effective. Um, if folks want a really deep dive on Eric's team structure, you can take a picture. He's shared it with you. He's open to the kimono. One of the best examples of community giving back. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up for a moment so people can get their, their shots. And then um, talk about communication, though, in, in this model. Um, how have you seen it work? How do you want it to work? Right. So how I want it to work is kind of how I've seen it work. 
<laughs> and and that's we're going to try to stick as closely to the agile ceremonies as we can. So that's going to include the daily stand-ups, typically like 15 or 30 minutes at the beginning of the day, where the the dev team and the scrum master will be there, product owner, and they'll go through what they did yesterday, what they did today, what they're working on, if there's any blockers. And the Scrum Master's responsibility, partly, is to help clear any roadblocks. So for that constant communication is key. Um, other meetings that we will do is the, the sprint planning, um, sprint backlog prioritization, sprint retrospective. So I, I haven't touched on this one yet, but uh, this meeting is crucial. It's done at the end of sprints. And it's basically like a lessons learned. It's like, what did we do well? What didn't we do well? How can we improve? And an effective Scrum Master is going to take action items based on whatever was discussed. So just making continuous improvement. Again, I'm a big Agile fangirl, but um, that ability to look back at a delivery and see what you've learned, talk about it as a team, I think probably resonates with a lot of folks and it's really, really important, particularly when it comes to automation because there's always another use case in the pipeline, right, that you wanna tackle. Um, I think I have one more question before we open it up to Q. Oh yeah. So you're bringing this best practice team resourcing model, right? Um, you brought it in as a response to a catalyst in the business and the growth of the program moving from uh, the business to engine. What line of business was it, by the way, that it started in? The, I think it was customer experience. Customer experience, okay. Um, what's ahead? If you're sitting here in this chair a year from now talking to folks, what, what, what's on the roadmap that, that you'll be really excited to have delivered? Cool, well, I'll, I'll go with the, the first one, which isn't so exciting, but it's just to achieve a steady state with all of our new roles and responsibilities. Don't underestimate the steady state. <laughs> Right? It's important. <laughs> Necessary, right? But the second thing that we want to do is to increase business-wide awareness of the program. So we'll be doing road shows and just kind of marketing some of our PA wins and really demonstrate what kind of value they can get from RPA. And then the third thing we want to do is, it's kind of a hot topic, it's uh, expand citizen development. Okay. So, okay. Uh, a little bit of background is, is we thought we would do a complete hybrid operating model in the beginning days. We would try to do trainings every year and have like as many or even more citizen developers as centralized folks, but it, that didn't really stick. Uh, through, through the trainings the first couple of years, um, to date we have just a couple who are actively creating bots, but their, their roles have shifted from the first or second year that I've met them. Now they're kind of like automation champions for their department. So they, they do 100% uh, build bots, build automations. Um, so our goal for expanding citizen development is to learn from them, uh, figure out why they were successful, and if there's anything that we can do to market to the business to help uncover the next batch of uh, effective long-term citizen developers, then we'll, we'll kind of pitch that to them and try to get their help there. So stability, marketing, and citizen development. These are very, very common trajectories for a lot of people in this room. And it's interesting that, that we're wrapping this part on citizen development um, because that is also very common. We'd heard, heard from so many of your peers out here that um, I always like describe citizen development growth in terms of like the Yelp model. Because you know, Yelp's business model is based on like millions and millions and millions of consumers, but only 1% of Yelp subscribers actually post reviews, and 10% comment, and the other 90 consume. And that one, 10, 90, also is very similar with citizen developers. You start out with a big pool, you get people who do create and contribute, and then you get the 1% that really sticks, right? Um, can you share with us, is there any common profile between these couple of folks who really became your champions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first thing. Are they thing, secret nerds? Are they? <laughs> well, <laughs> no. The, the first thing is a shout out to Automation Anywhere. They they both said that like RPA saved their careers, but uh, they. I, mean, I did not pay him to say that. <laughs> I did not. I did not. But I did notice between the two of them, 
they both had some kind of technical uh, skills prior to going to RPA. So between the two of them, they had some experience with the database design, with writing queries to, to pull data, and that kind of jump-started their uh, interest in RPA because they wanted to automate what they were doing, but they also saw opportunities across their team where they would directly do it. But I think why it really stuck with them too, and it was like a common linkage between the two, the two guys, is that their management were really passionate about it. They, they wanted them to do the training, and these two individuals too, they. They just had the right mindset, like the, this problem-solving mindset where if they saw a challenge, they saw RPA as this open box to, to solve it. So technical aptitude, management support, and the mindset. Curious mind. Great. Um, well, you've really taken Trinet on a journey. Automation is growing. It moved from customer experience to engineering. You came back to Trinet and brought the Agile model. Right, you're taking folks on a journey now. Um, I really want to. I want to make sure we have enough time. I want to open it up to Q and A. I know that there's folks who have questions for you. Shoot, all right. All right. Oh well. Okay. First, and I think I can see your name. Is it Daryl? Daniel. 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 You are asker number one. Go for it. Step one, step zero. It's a great question. Okay, step zero, you bought the product. Step 0 0.1, your first three hires, what, what are they? I would, do, I would do someone who's built a number of bots and put them in production um, because they can kind of help drive standards and best practices around development, around design, um, and maybe even provide you some, uh, create some sort of like production framework, for example. Um, so once you get that, then you can drive the standards for all the remaining bots. Um, solution architect, uh, I'm not sure if, if you're working with anyone in your, in your IT org who's like with the architecture mindset. I'm sure you are. If, if you're not, then, then maybe getting some, um, some support there just to make sure that, and, it, and maybe it's not even so much a big concern now with the cloud implementation. It takes a lot of that. Um, planning out of the picture, but um, to, to get them involved too, to kind of talk about like how you want to implement like the CICD pipeline in your organization to, could get you off to, to some good momentum. Okay, sounds like a master developer. Our official recommendation, which folks is on the Pathfinder destination site that you may have heard about, is uh, right out of the gate as a developer and a business analyst. And I'm sure folks here also probably have their own experiences. Adam, I see you nodding your head. Mm-hmm. Um, more qu he's here. More questions. Yes, sir. It's a good question. We, we just had this discussion a couple weeks back. I was curious about it too. And I think our plan is to definitely include them into the, the scrum calls at least initially, we'll see how it goes if we have to adjust it. And the reason for that is we're trying to enforce a single centralized process intake for all of RPA. So we don't want to open up our platform as a shared platform for, for the business without us vetting all the use cases together. We, we want to make sure that whatever we're automating are quality use cases where um, we're okay giving up licenses or, or server utilization. So, yeah, I think we, we probably would include them into the Scrum calls. More questions? Carolina.
support some of the venues and like have been different things like commons versus scrum. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've noticed in here is that uh, we uh, are inspired to be self-organizing. So we get the backlog for three months. Uh, we do a sprint every two weeks, but we plan for three months, four quarters. So it's, it's very difficult to kind of plan that, that time ahead. Um, but then how it works is like we get the backlog and we try to break down Nice question. <laughs> so I've seen it work in the, in the past where, like to your point, you would have one epic and then underneath it could be individual stories for like different requirements or functions from the PDD. But from that, I think what we're going to try to do is to have a single developer for an epic. Um, and then if, if you all have uh, more experienced developers, maybe that means like a, a lead or more senior developer who's kind of tied to that epic yeah. and then could maybe more like a developer agnostically have other people work on other functionalities as long as you have that one person on it. Okay, we've got a few different models here. Thank you for sharing that. It's yeah. awesome. I hope everyone heard. I, maybe I should pass the mic. Um, okay, I think we have. Do we have time for a few more questions? Yeah, see you not. Okay. Yes, sir. And actually, will you just uh, when you ask your question, share your name and where you're from? Gotcha, gotcha. Maybe I should I should pass this mic to to this gentleman right here. But <laughs> but uh, for us, we're we're kind of anticipating that being a, a big challenge as well, because it's kind of like a, a natural pull off of Agile is, is the whole identity access management topic. So we're trying to kind of just compile a list of all the system SMEs and try to have some sort of regular cadence. Maybe it's uh, bi-monthly, but but just understanding who to go to for 
what type of access. Um, if, I don't know if you have like any kind of cheat sheet or kind of like an application inventory where you have that information available, but I don't know, do you have anything else to add to that, Kristen? Well, what I can tell you is, first of all, we have to wrap up the conversation, but nope, we can go. Oh, we have time. Okay. <laughs> Oh, recap the question. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm also gonna pass the mic, okay? So you were asking about how to make your sprints clean and deliverable per, right? Okay, Carolina, and share your name and where you're from. Uh, Carolina Lockyer, Nike. Um, we had the same issue, and this is something that we experienced as well, like, you know, um, being able to, when you move your, um, your solutions or your potential solutions to development to actually uh, enable or empower your developers to sit down and develop. That's a big, big, big issue. Like it always gets stuck and then you never ended up uh, delivering what you uh, uh, target to. So the way how I'm thinking we will be hopefully solutioning for that and that's something I did in my previous company is that we have very clear roles and responsibilities for the whole life cycle of the project. So Agile doesn't only start with like development, but before, especially with our type of products because you have like the highly predictable. So your Agile, when you kind of collaborate and all of that happens pre-development. That's where you create what's the best solution for this, right? When you go to development, you pretty much have to deliver the bot that you create in your PDD or your solution design document. You cannot just like, oh, I'm gonna give you half of a bot, right? So. Uh, you gotta do the agile a little bit pre-development, and that's when you go and define, like for example, to cover for those cases, I knew I'm gonna deliver a solution in um, in SAP. I'll get the B B A the B A S to work on any, any access for developers, any t any data that needs to be in the kind of sand environments, uh, sandbox environments, and all of that. So when we pass things into development they ready, they ready to sit down, they got their IDs, uh, they got um, the environment set up, and that's all ready for them to actually develop. All right, yes sir. Hey, this is Chandra. So, I have seen in this slide, RPA uh, slide, RPA COE slide, where it's talking about business feasibility, okay? So, but what about technical feasibility? We have run into some issues where Business feasibility comes out pretty good, eight by 10 rating, okay? But when we went to technical feasibility, because of the, some of the limitations of the product, it's three by 10. So what happens is, if you take that uh, one developer taking the epic and uh, you know building the bot, they build out of 15 steps, 10 steps, they spend two sprints or one sprint, and finally, uh, they couldn't get uh, work around on how to uh, you know, automate a particular step, and then we have to uh, put that on hold and move on to the next step. So, any any recommendations on doing the technical feasibility, where in the life cycle, or what are the best practices in accomplishing that? Oh, nice. So uh, the question, by the way, is business feasibility is a big part of the conversation, but what about technical feasibility? Got it. Uh, so, for us, uh, as part of our automation team. RPA is just a single vertical, and, and there's other applications uh, across our, our director uh, level team. So prior to us even taking on any of those RPA processes, we have to vet and make sure that we're using the right tool uh, to, to create that solution. So I think with that initial vetting of the business case or, or the process and, and making sure that we're applying RPA to the right use cases would, to your point, kind of vet out some of the of the processes that, that might not be good candidates for RPA, uh, but to the technical design or feasibility that you were talking about too, we created one of our new roles was the solution architecture role, and, and this person is going to kind of help with driving the the bot design best practices, and they'll hand off the design requirement to the developers who will just execute on on building that. So we're hoping with those two those two actions to, to try to catch some of the, the technical feasibility you're talking about, but. I am clearly hearing that this is a great topic for a future user group meeting, so I'll file that away. Um, Mark Rodriguez. <clears throat> One thing we also do is whenever we have our solutions architect and there's challenges, 
we will run a proof of concept specific to testing that portion of the uh, step before we ever accept the full solution so we can proper, properly size a user story and make sure that there is a that we can actually overcome that roadblock so that we that happens quite a bit in our processes uh, I work in our digital transformation group so we run through probably 150 different bots a year just solely doing spot solutions and we're really trying to get to uh, and I'll ask a question here how do you take those spot solutions and understand the end-to-end -end automation and really where you can see some real time savings of value as opposed to just spot solutions. Oh, wow. Do we put you on the hot seat? <laughs> Kristen, do you wanna take this one? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if you if this is not an area where you've delved into, but the question is like that whole end-to-end -end process, right? And beyond beyond the simple bot and the simple ones, tactical solution, right? And I think everyone wants to get better at that for sure. Um, do you have a specific like example you want to flesh? It? You can just give a high-level example for the crowd. Like we try to do this, and yeah, yeah. So that's a. Yeah, that's a great example. So again, we have a, a simple intake form. Someone makes a request and we have a, a number of product owners or business analysts that will take a request, but they don't often ask the you know five whys or they don't get the beginning and the ending piece. So what happens is somebody has is doing one portion of a bot automation and then you know someone else has developed maybe in three sprints three prior sprints a similar piece or something that uh, is further downstream so just wanting to help how do we educate our team members to fully see that end-to-end -end automation are there special meetings that you're having are there different business requirement documents that you're going through and uh, just starting that conversation we've tried to implement business partners uh, on our side where we have people who have, uh, you know, are associated with the practice area, so they're in expected to learn more about the processes. Um, is it, you know, Fortress IQ on their task mining? I don't know, just uh, open discussion, really. Okay, well, this clearly is a great discussion. I, I will share a couple of highlights of what we've heard most common and what we recommend. Um, I don't want to put Eric on the spot for this one. This is uh, what's Mark describing is expectation setting with the business so that you get the thought process all the way through, not just can you automate this, but why? What is the business impact? What is the value it drives? We typically recommend looking at three things and you, you basically have to educate, you have to roadshow this with your business partners is what is the de degree of complexity? what is the de degree of risk, and what is the degree of value. And those are three areas where it just takes constant education and examples. If you get your poster child of like, this person thought the process all the way through, they asked the right questions, and not that you wanna shame anyone, but here's one that didn't work out so well because we didn't ask the right questions or we didn't answer the right questions. And you keep wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. And the more poster children you get, the more people in your organization understand, oh, this is what it's like to think the process all the way through. Sure. I can add something. Sorry, oh, yeah, just one second, because we have heard a bunch from you, but I see two people behind you who are also waiting. So um, this is such a great discussion, you guys, <laughs> um, in the black dress. So um, we do have a, have a few questions, but before that, we have some thoughts about the last three questions that we have discussed. Eric and I, this is Eric as well. Okay. Eric and I are from Genworth Financial. Uh, we have been, um, like, we are, our RPA program is four years old, just like yours. Um, like, uh, our, um, Eric and I were trained. We have developed, like, I lead the team, so we have done it, done a lot of it. We still have a long way to go. But just a few thoughts, technical feasibility and uh, the like a more uh, education on end-to-end -end process and how to integrate smaller parts into it. Well, I can share what we have done, what we have seen working for us and what our intent is in the next um, like six months, uh, one year to, to do. One, um, like we are a part of our centralized, uh, like we are the COE. Uh, mainly technical people. We have, our model is different. We have a lot of people in the organization whom we have trained, business, technical. 
one thing we do at the beginning, and we, um, like, uh, we, we did the train the trainer, and we are both certified trainers at Genworth. We know how, like, what is important to Genworth, how our organization works. So one thing that we include as a part of our training class is a mix of technical and business folks. Technical people need to know how to ask business questions. Business, uh, business people know, need to know how to, what, what a loop means, for example. So just, just to do that. So basically, we trained everybody to basically ask the questions, what to consider, where is this data coming from? Where is it going? What happens before? What happens after? What team um, like, you know, is sending you this? Where is it going? What, what is the end goal? Um, all of this, we um, actually educate them to ask those questions. In addition, that is the training part. Second step, we um, are working on a, pro on, a, on a process, like people are coming back from the pandemic, so we, it's just picking up, as to having a liaison from our team, the COE, working with the business area specifically, where we do the technical feasibility at the beginning. So this is what your process is, these are the applications, this is what the flow looks like. In our experience, this is successful, this is not. And our team is constantly updated on the new features that are uh, with Automation Anywhere. We are engaged with the communities to see what others have done. So like at Genworth, we are the first step to answer those questions. Uh, and um, the third step that we are trying to do, Eric, like what do you, like Eric helps uh, a bit, works one-on-one -on, -one on specific bots and applications. So if somebody's stuck, we are here, what do I do now? So I just, I'm just generally a solution architect in, as well, and I just leave myself kind of open in certain ways to allow people to come to me and say, this page just isn't working. And for them to feel not like they're not alone, especially for citizen developers, that somebody else is willing to help just in troubleshooting has helped a lot of people join the team that probably would have felt stuck and given up a long time ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. My question was. <laughs> My question would be in this new um, format for your team. How are you dealing with maintenance? Because you were talking about moving away from, you know, people staying on one uh, bot and staying on one process, but if they're moving away from it, do they need to train the maintainer, or is that a separate role? Nice. So we're covering that in our post-deployment production support, um, and there's some some steps that we have to to do in order for our support teams to be able to own that facilitation channel. The first thing is to really um, enhance all the process documentation and to create a, a run book for all the processes. So for our production support to, to have that in their, in their back pocket, kind of have a high level understanding of the process, but more importantly, what do they do if something breaks? How do they interpret technical business exceptions? What actions do they need to take? Who, who do they need to contact? Um, and then like which developer do they need to reach out to and, and escalate if it's a true defect or a, a bug fix needed? Yeah, yeah, at some stage. They, they wouldn't be completely removed from the process, um, but there should be that knowledge transfer uh, that, that takes place where they do the handover to support. So a mix of levels. Okay, folks, our time is up. Um, Eric, thank you so much for sharing where you are in your journey. And wow, great conversation and questions from this group. So um, really excited for the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.